All right. Hello, Natalie Hi. and Lynn together. Have you have you done a pod get together yet? No, <gasps> not together. <laughs> wow. You guys were on stage together in Miami, though. Yes. Yes, we were. Well, we feel very privileged to have two heavyweights together. Two That's of right. our favorite people. That's right. Two people we've got coming to Bedford next April. Woo! Yeah. Two new football hooligans. <laughs> uh, how are you, Natalie? I'm doing great. Lynn, uh, that was the biggest cue I've ever seen for a book signing ever. I wish you brought more books. <laughs> we, we ran out in the middle of the signing, so we had to start signing uh, hyperinflated Venezuelan boulevards as bookmarks for people. <laughs> but there's no shortage of them. No shortage of those. There's plenty of those. So we're it was still kind of able to at least give something to people. That's amazing to see. Uh, uh, congratulations on that. It's just amazing how well your book's done. I was humbled by that line. I don't know. And, and it, just the, the people coming up and all the different types of faces too. People from different parts of the world, all different ages, different genders. Remarkable. Do you, do you know what happened to me yesterday? Well, so someone there. thought you were a bit boy again. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different, you ever heard this story? <laughs> I went to Bitcoin Miami uh, a couple of years ago and I walk in the first thing, you know how people want photos? This guy comes to me, he goes, oh my God, it's you, can I have a photo? I'm like, yeah. So he stands there, he takes a photo, he goes, thanks bit boy, walks off. <laughs> <laughs> but so anyway, no, this was uh, yesterday, this guy comes, he's, I've stood there talking away and uh, Lindsay, and this guy comes up and goes, oh, can I have a photo? I'm like, yeah. So he gives me his camera because he wants me to take a photo of him and live. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Uh, cool conference, though. Yes. Very cool conference. Uh, and uh, you two have been doing exceptionally well. And uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to both of you. Uh, Natalie, what is a economic anthropologist? Well, uh one could argue that all anthropologists are economic anthropologists in so far as the discipline of anthropology really has its genesis in questions of value. Okay. And what is value? Um, but over time, you know, there have emerged these specializations within the field of cultural anthropology. Some people really like to talk about markets and money and other anthropologists like to talk about other stuff. And what do you like to talk about? Money. Value. Oh, value. Yeah. So I actually came to anthropology through the anthropology of religion. I was very interested in the sacred um, as this kind of uh, social unifying principle of absolute value and how that then inflects value um, in more transactional forms of exchange. And so my path to economics has it went through religion. <laughs> well, so one of the interesting things me and Danny have been talking about a lot recently is that I don't think a lot of people where I am in the UK think about money much. Mm -hmm. They really don't. It's just, they just use it. Yeah. And as I've traveled, the worse the economic environment is, the more people understand money. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the, the better the money is, the more you can be gaslit by the government. Yeah. You can't get away with it when you've got bad money because you have to understand it. Yeah, it's like that that kind of tradition of boiling the fro frog slowly so they don't jump out. You know, if you're in an environment where the money's obviously bad, people are more aware of it. It's hard not to be. Like if your money supply is growing by 20% a year, you you notice that pretty quickly. Whereas if you're kind of growing at a slower pace, you're able to kind of dilute people slowly, dilute people slowly, have all these kind of different frictions on them, and it's hard for them to realize or know that there could be something better. Which is why you wrote a book called Broken Money. Yes. <laughs> to tell everyone. But it's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon now because I feel like we're heading into a potential phase where people have to start thinking about money. I, it's, it's certainly starting to see this in the UK now mm. in that whilst we've had quoted, say, 10% inflation, what you're starting to see people share on Twitter or on Facebook is uh, photos of their shopping. And they're saying, here's my shopping basket for the week. I spent mm. 60 pounds and you're really seeing maybe a meal, maybe two meals and a breakfast worth. And you're looking and thinking, uh, a couple of years ago, that would, you could buy a week of shopping for that. Mm. And so I've noticed that people are starting to get squeezed. And I was watching your talk this morning. Mm. I wrote some notes with, mm. oh, I put it on my phone. I'm going to go back to here because there's something that really stood out to me. I tried to explain to Daniel, I did a really bad job. <laughs> but you talked about the narrow corridor of liberty. Yeah. Can you explain that 
in, in, in a better way than I try to to Danny, and then I'm going to tell you what I've been thinking with regards to this. Yeah, of course. So this is this is a theory put forward by um, two political scientists, um, James Robinson and Darren Achimoglu, um, to describe what happens when the state and society are in a race for technological supremacy. So, you know, the state makes some moves and then society makes some moves. And there's this, this competition that actually improves both state and society over time if the power is balanced. Um, it creates this narrow corridor in which liberty can flourish because in their theory, liberty is actually um, a product of uh, the rule of law, but the rule of law that does not or does not function as tyranny. And so, you know, when does law become tyranny? I mean, there's no absolute bright line, but as the corridor collapses, that's when we see tyranny emerge. Right. So what I wrote next to that was CBDCs versus Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Would you argue, therefore, that race is the narrow corridor of liberty in relation to money? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we're in a race of Bitcoin versus CBDCs right now. That's right. The scary stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Danny brought up the point that a lot of people have been saying on stage this week that Fed now is a CBDC. Is it? It doesn't meet the kind of strict definition of a CBDC, um, but it increases their surveillance capabilities on transactions. So there's certainly CBDC-like aspects. There's certainly, if there's a spectrum there, it's another step closer to CBDC, but it's different than a full-blown CBDC. Yeah, so um, sorry to jump in there, but I think this is this is a really important question. So this is one of the things I was um, getting at in my talk uh, on anthropology of money. There is a difference between payment and settlement. These are two different social processes. And so what FedNow is, is it is a network for real-time settlement. It is not a method of payment, which is what money is or what a CBDC is. So ostensibly, if you know you had um, a, a CBDC, then the method of payment te technically would be so merged with the ledger for settlement that it's hard to distinguish the two. But in fact, they are two different technologies. So is it a layer one CBDC? Well, that so a CBDC doesn't actually have to have any particular technical architecture. You okay. know, in the early days, they were trying to do a blockchain CBDC. I think, you know, I, I don't know of, you know, which countries today are still committed to blockchain versus other types of ledgers. But I think they all figured out we don't actually need a blockchain to do a CBDC because it's just a shared ledger. Yeah. It's just a database that we all, you know, control and update. Matthew Mazinski, who I, I think he's doing a CBDC tracker for Human Rights Foundation, pushes back quite strongly against uh, the fact that Fed now is a CBDC. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know that I think a lot of people kind of jump to the conclusion that this is additional control. And obviously, that's something to push back against, which I completely understand. Um, but I, I'm just interested. I think he he explains it like a very similar payment system to what we have in the UK with faster pay. Mm -hmm. Are they architecturally the same? Um, I don't know if they're architecturally the same because I haven't studied both um, architectures technically, but um, in effect, FedNow is trying to catch up. I mean, they've, they've stated this outright with what many other countries already have, you know, whether it's South Korea or others, they have real time central bank settlement. Um, we, um, we spoke uh, a long time ago, we, well, maybe a year ago when we covered the refounding or the re I always pronounce this in, was it the refounding of the American dream? Or, yes. I yes. was going to say refinding of the American dream. Oh, yeah. Um, Both. And one of the things that we've been talking about regularly is that I feel like I'm really struggling to explain this oncoming storm mm -hmm. to my friends and my family. We mm -hmm. did a show this morning with James Lavish and Preston Pish, which you would have loved, Lim, because we were uh, covering uh, the deck clock. Uh, we were covering the uh, issues within the bond, bond markets, the potential of, well, the next decade of inflation, which you and I have talked about, whether it's going to be a slow creep or they're going to come in with high inflation. But I can't communicate these things to my mm -hmm. friends. But you can see the future. You can look at the various technologies that governments are bringing in to bring more control over the people. We can see this uh, 
uh, this control over money. We can see the impact it's having on people. Yet we are like a frog being boiled slowly. Um, and I'm starting to wonder if, when you talked about the refound, finding, refounding of the American dream, yeah. it's almost like we need a, a rethink of govern, governance in a world which is digital. Mm -hmm. Because it feels far too easy for government to take too much control in a digital world. Right. Absolutely. No, I mean, the, the fundamental innovation of the Enlightenment era political revolutions was separation of powers, was, you know, how do you prevent power from just metastasizing? Well, you separate it out and you, you give different branches of government different functions and then um, allow them to check each other's power and that will keep it in check. What we found is there, there was some validity to that that worked for a time. Um, but over time, there ended up being this narrowing sort of revolving door between different branches of government, um, government and, and industry. And so it, the power of the state has, in effect, been a shared point of interest among all branches of government. And so I, I would suggest that the system of checks and balances has broken down in, in the United States. When you say it's broken down, like what are the key signals for that breaking down for you? Um, so things like increasingly legislating through federal agencies, which are the executive branch instead of through Congress. Um, so, you know, the federal government currently has, um, we don't know how many federal agencies because there's no actual shared definition of what it is. But each agency has the mandate to create policy in its sort of area of remit. Um, these are organizations not accountable to Congress for the most part, not accountable to the American people. Often they function completely in secrecy. They're political appointees. And so um, in effect, you have law now routinely being made through the executive branch and um, judicial collusion um, with that in the process of judicial review. So, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the 1954 legislation, um, I mean, this is, this is actually an example of congressional legislation, but um, 1954 legislation that uh, suspended, in effect, uh, the Fourth Amendment um, 100 miles within the U.S. border um, that was upheld. Uh, qualified immunity has been repeatedly upheld. Um, the uh, independence of federal agencies from uh, suit by U.S. citizens uh, has been upheld. And so we have a, a Byzantine um, bureaucratic system that, in effect, has created this unaccountable form of executive power, and that is the consolidating state. So is, this, is the state winning the race at the moment? I would say yes, it is. And how much would you point to money being as a, a driving factor behind this? Well, money is just one mechanism of control, but it's an important one. It's, it's an information technology. So um, the money is a social institution whose purpose is to facilitate exchange. Well, exchange is another word for communication. Um, the government always has a vested interest in who communicates with whom about what and for what purpose. Until recently, it's not been possible to exercise a, a certain level of granular control over financial communication between people. But now it is. And with the CBDC, that would get considerably worse? Uh, ab absolutely. I mean, um, it's, it's the transaction itself, but, um, you know, transacting is also now intrinsically tied with uh, verifiable identity. And so it's, you know, in effect, the end of privacy as we know it. <laughs> Lynn, you obviously study macro markets, um, you study money. You've obviously written this fantastic book. How much correlation have you seen between what is breaking in the financial system and the increase in control and kind of uh, weird kind of decisions that are coming from central government? I think there's a big correlation, and I think there's also arguably an even bigger correlation in the political polarization that happens because people start to feel that something's broken but then they can't necessarily put their finger on what's broken, in part because the way the system's designed, it's very opaque, right? People don't, 
the average person doesn't know what the money supply growth rate is. So they don't know why things are maybe getting more expensive than their wages are keeping up with. Um, they see the wealth concentration happening, but then they dif differ on why that's happening, right? So hmm. some of the things are more transparent, like different, say, uh, tax rates. And then, of course, they can be obfuscated by having it so that you can have all these complicated tax ways to, say, not pay significant taxes if you're, if you're wealthy enough, for example. So there's like somewhat transparent things there. But then, for example, they don't see like the differing kind of rates of credit that can be made available to different entities and how that can suck kind of value up um, to the well-connected. Um, and so all this kind of steps along the way, there's just so many opaque things that are happening with the money system that fuels some of the big political issues that then polarizes people. And then they end up kind of talking about the same sort of thing, but in very different language and very different understandings of why this is happening or how to fix it. Because the the plumbing underneath is complex, it's opaque. And, you know, it's just, unless you study money, and even if you study money, it's it's hard to figure out. And are these complexities essentially apolitical? It doesn't really matter who's in power. The, the same things tend to happen. Generally speaking, I mean, there's, you know, there's different flavors. Uh, but in terms of the, the money system, you don't see a lot of change uh, from party to party in that sense. Um, they tend to, to err in certain directions. But really, the, especially in the U.S., but also just elsewhere, the, the mechanism itself is just kind of perpetuating. So you can make minor changes um, to that based on how you vote, but the but the actual structures are going to be different. I think the politics kind of seems to matter more for the social realm, whereas the financial realm is like a almost like a system, and that system's locked in, and that system changes very slowly. And so, is the social realm really becoming a distraction to the financial realm? I mean, that's a question really for both of you, because mm. I feel like it is. Some mm. people would argue that that's intentional. That basically, yeah. those that don't want issues focused on the money divide people, focus on other things. It's hard to say how much that is well-crafted, but for, for example, you see in some kind of campaigns to stir political chaos, like when Russia would do it, they would purposely make all these different groups and they don't really care about any of these views. What they're trying to do is sow chaos. Um, but I think you can also have that domestically as well. You can, you can kind of distract a group to kind of align with you against another thing, even if they're aligning against their own interests. Yeah, because this is where it becomes really super tricky. Because yeah, I do. I mean, I struggle with a lot of these concepts, which is why I talk to you because you know you're the expert on this. But this is so complex that how do we even try to communicate this out to a wider audience? Because if democracy is essentially broken, mm -hmm. yeah, it's broken in in this kind of instance in that it doesn't really matter who you vote for. We've got an election coming in the UK. Yeah, if we vote for Labour, my life's not going to change that much difference. Mm. If they vote for Conservatives, it's not going to change much difference. But what we do is see this continual slow decline. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't have a surplus anymore. Mm -hmm. We have a constant deficit, which is increasing. Um, I don't even see a world where we get back to a surplus. So it feels like we're, we're, we're constantly going back to these elections. We're voting for a new party and not much is changing. But we're missing the opportunity for really pushing for reforms. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know how do you start to communicate these things to people because it seems like it's so far and so opaque. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so one of the critical takeaways that I got from my time doing public policy work uh, in Texas and, and beyond is that re-election depends on being able to demonstrate to your constituency that you have done stuff for them. And if you're an elected official, uh, generally that means passing laws. And so you have a set of incentives for officials to just pass stuff, just write laws, pass them, almost regardless of what's in them sometimes, unless, you know, somebody pays really close attention. Um, but it's more for the optics to show that, you know, I'm out here fighting for you. And so you have a metastasizing system of torts. Then you have a metastasizing set of um, government agencies, executive agencies. Um, and all of this is being driven by the short-term career interests of people staffing the machine of the state. Um, and so there, there's actually a really interesting research paper released uh, yesterday about uh, China's decline since 2007. 
and how a lot of it is attributable to um, public uh, employees at the municipal level and city level being persuaded to give tax breaks to established but highly inefficient uh, large enterprises, corporations, to keep them competitive financially. And so you have you have a system that's interestingly uh, decentralized in the sense that nobody's out there telling all these politicians to be driven by short-term career self-interest. They just are. And so it's like a it's like a downward spiral market dynamic. So the thing about you know what you were saying about deficits, um, spiraling and people not knowing what to do is you ha- you have to reverse the entire vicious cycle. You have to make it a virtuous cycle. How do you do that? By creating an engine of wealth formation, capital formation, and economic productivity. But that is opposite the interests of the people manning the machine of the state who are seeking their career longevity by doing precisely the opposite. So this is the, I just wrote this down, this is yeah. the clash of the political cycle and the economic cycle. Mm-hmm. Because to, I guess what it is, it's like as a parent, like as a parent with children, you have to do tough things for them. It really hurts you. You don't want to do it. You have to give them you know, mm-hmm. punishment. You have to say you can't go out and see your friends because you did something wrong. You have to, you know, you have to give them financial penalties, all those things. But as a as a politician, you don't want to make those tough choices because you won't get reelected. Yeah. And therefore, if you have the infinite money printer, the this essentially the design of the political system will ultimately lead to economic decline. Mm-hmm. Is there any examples where it hasn't? I mean, it just feels like because this the state just always grows. Well, what one way I'd phrase it right now is that we're kind of seeing the failure of incrementalism. So a lot of people, the way they they engage politics. They think if we just get like our person in charge, we can start turning this around. <laughs> and then that person, either well intentioned or not, gets eaten by the machine, and the machine just keeps going. And then people say, "Well, if we only get the next person in charge, we can turn this around." And so all these kind of like small measures are just going against basically the Borg of of the bureaucracy of the system of, as things are designed. And historically, you tend to see kind of like things go on and on and on and on. And then a gigantic trend change. Mm-hmm. And that's when it really matters what the culture of the society is, because that's when you can get either very virtuous outcomes or horrific outcomes. And the way I would describe it is that when you look at, like I approach financial systems in the way that I approach systems engineering, like uh, as though I'm analyzing a complex system, because that's what we're doing. And there's st- stable systems and unstable systems or marginally stable systems. and The financial system has all of the traits of an unstable system in the sense that for decades and decades, you have rising debt percentage of GDP, falling interest rates, which allows you to pay for those rising debts, even though you're getting rising debts. Basically, the interest expense is not rising. And then when you have a gigantic debt bubble, when you hit zero rates and you start going sideways to up in interest rates while you still have that very large public debt burden, that's when a lot of the things that keep getting their, you know, you kick the can down the road over and Mm. over again. That's when it starts to materialize in the present. And that's when you look around and you wonder, like, why is none of this working anymore? Why is this, you know, why is this getting increasingly bad? It's because we've kind of extended the system as far as it can go. Out of bullets. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're out of bullets. And now we're kind of dealing with the consequences of a system that always, you know, for the past, say, four plus decades or more, was always unstable. But that could be delayed, deferred push onto someone else, often in the developing world, yeah. kind of push mm-hmm. that. But now a lot of these things are starting to hit in the present. Um, so we're there right now. Yeah, I think we've been there really since the global financial crisis. I think this is um, I think this is a multi-step process. That's one thing I cover in my work is that basically these things historically, at least with the data we have and logically, tend to go in two phases. You have kind of the private debt bubble blows up. And then the response, almost inevitably, not every time, but almost inevitably, is to push that onto the public level. Mm-hmm. So you bail out the system, you bring all that debt or a lot of the debt onto the public level, some some part of the private sector deleverage, and then the public debt part keeps building. And then the second hit is when the public debt bubble starts to have a problem. And I think that's that's the phase that we're in now. And that's still a multi-year process playing out. 
are there examples where this has played out before? Or are we in a very unique situation in, in that this, this is tot- uh, truly global? I don't know, 2008 was a global crisis, but it, that kind of doesn't feel like such a bad situation anymore. I mean, you, the US printed 500 billion in the last two weeks, and it was 800 billion bailout for 2008. So it feels like we're in a very extreme scenario. I would say one is that the more connected the world is, um, the more it's going to be a worldwide issue versus local issues. Um, You know, people that have seen the podcast before probably know that I often compare the 2010s to the 1930s and the 2020s to the 1940s. So there are a lot of elements back then. What's what's new this time is that most of these kind of long-term debt cycle or institutional cleansing cycle things that we go through, fourth hurting, whatever you want to call it, usually there's a changeover in the type of money we use. You go from, say, free banking to central banking uh, with a gold underlay. Then you go to uh, another central banking model where you don't even have a gold underlay anymore. And what we've never done before is go through one of these cycles when we were fiat currency going into it. So what comes out, right? Do We've, we've never gone in this gigantic fiat currency global cycle, have a whole sovereign debt crisis on a global scale, <laughs> and then see what's on the other side of that. That's new. And, and, and uh, some people listening can be like, well, it's Bitcoin, but I don't think we're there yet. There, yeah, I mean, um, there's no precise way to tell what the tipping point is, but um, in when high inflation becomes hyperinflation, that's usually the moment in which the crisis of confidence really spreads beyond, you know, the small circle of people who, you know, may have been sounding the alarm about it all along. You know, I'm I'm reminded of, of Weimar Germany when, you know, there was uh, there was high inflation um, after they went off the gold standard in uh, 1914. Um, but hyperinflation didn't really hit until the end of 1922-23. Uh, um, and that was the point at which um, you know, farmers stopped accepting um, the Reichsmark uh, in compensation for their labor, and the country was put on the verge of starvation. Um, and so it's that collapse when, you know, I was alluding to the state theory of money earlier, money as law or the thing that is decreed by the state as legal tender, when people just stop accepting it, that's the point at which there's crisis. And I would add that it's not even just hyperinflation that can do it. It's it's the perception of the loss of control. Right. And so, for example, there are a lot of developing countries today where they're not in, say, outright hyperinflation. Yeah. They might just have double-digit inflation on a recurring, regular basis. It's like a background part of life. Mm. Um, and there's no expectation that they're going to get it under control. And that's that's kind of the world. That That's historically a developing market phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And you can get that kind of situation in um, the developed world if this is left unchecked. I think that's kind of on the train we're going for is that you can call for kind of a central bank losing control in the sense that there's there becomes no clear way where they can get it back down to their, you know, their kind of prior baseline of money supply growth and price level changes and things like that, where there's too much public debt for them to tighten the way they want to. And then the, the challenge is that when you have a lot of public debt, interest rates start losing their effect um, they become more complicated tools to try to slow down inflation um, compared to when you have lower public debt levels and higher private debt levels. Um, and so when I get questions on hyperinflation stuff, I kind of put that aside and I say, we don't have to be there for this to be a problem. Like if you look at right now, the market still generally thinks the Fed can get the current situation under control. And maybe for a few years they can, right? It's, you know, you can cyclically get it under control potentially. Um so right now, whenever you see kind of a higher inflation print than expected, you'll see the dollar strengthen and you'll see other, you know, because they say, well, now the Fed's got to get even tighter, right? Because they're, they're, they're going to get this, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that's the current kind of market reaction for how this is going. And when you go through the looking glass is when the market realizes they actually don't have control. Right. And it, we're not there yet, but I think we're on this kind of either multi-month or probably more realistically multi-year process of, of getting to that point. And so are you basically saying particularly high double-digit inflation is entirely within the realm of possibility within Western, you know, liberal democracies, within the UK, within Europe, within the US, in the nearer term, when I say near term, next few years? I would say within the 2020s, I think. Um, next, next few years, perhaps, um, I think that, what I look for is the ingredients that can lead to that. 
and I and I then judge the probability that those ingredients are building. So one would be energy security. Yeah, um, that's obviously in a dangerous spot right now. Um, and sometimes the problem goes away, but it, the structural issue is still there. Mm-hmm. So one would be energy security, and then the other one would be looking at the size of deficits, wondering how they're going to be financed, looking for any attempts to kind of improve the deficits, and then looking at the overall public debt to GDP ratios because. That's an indicator. 135%. Exactly. I'll never forget that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's an indicator that starts to become relevant because when you get to that very high level and you raise rates, at the same time as you're pushing down the private sector by raising those rates, you're also greatly increasing the deficits. Um, and so if you imagine two numbers, if you imagine the US in the 1970s, you know, the US had 30% debt to GDP. And most of the um, money creation was happening in the in the private sector, not all of it, but a lot of it. And um, when so when Volcker raised rates very high in that period, um, it did two things. One, it slowed down bank lending because now it's a much higher hurdle rate to borrow, but it also would increase the deficit to some extent because you know you're paying higher interest on your debt. But because that was so small, the negative impact on the private sector was much larger, meaning that those rate hikes were disinflationary. The problem is if you fast forward, let's even go past the current. Let's go to Japan. If you have 250% debt to GDP and you have pretty slow bank lending, almost all the money creation is really coming from the government deficits, the monetization mm. of those deficits. And so if you raise rates, you actually risk accelerating money supply growth because when you raise rates, the public interest expense will balloon significantly because you're doing it from a 250% debt to GDP base. Whereas you're not going to impact private sector lending much because that's already small relative to that. So huh. that's the problem is that as you get more and more debt on the public level, interest rates become a more mixed tool for addressing inflation and eventually can become literally a like a, a negative tool for dealing with it. So, so is the mistake here not letting things break? Things should be allowed to break and break at their natural kind of moment in time. Rather than kind of like this kick and count, because essentially they they keep blowing up the the balloon. Yeah, mm-hmm. and really, the, I would describe the moment as if you look at the global financial crisis, and this this also happened in the 1930s, which is you had decades and decades of building broad money compared to base money, and broad money is an IOU for base money, a fractionally reserved IOU, and when you get higher and higher debt, and then interest rates go all the way to zero, and things start to break, there's one of two things that's going to happen. Either those claims are going to start collapsing down closer to the base money, big deflationary collapse, or they're going to print a lot more base money mm-hmm. and make most of those broader claims money good. Money and good, but not purchasing power good. Not purchasing power good. Which means inflation. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what they did back in 2009, 2008, is they radically increased the base money, and they've been doing it ever since, to never let broad money collapse by any significant amount. Natalie, are you noticing any kind of shifts in the political discourse around this? And, and I bring it up because there's a couple of things I noticed recently, just just on the edges, Rishi Sunak in the UK um, gave an interview on the BBC, mm. and he said he wants to bring down inflation. He said because it's a tax, and it's a tax on the poorest people in society, which is a bit of a wow moment because... Mm-hmm. He's admitting that. Yeah. He's not admitting it's the government's fault, but he's admitting that. The lady from the BBC tried to challenge him and say it's not a tax. He said, no, it is. It is a tax. And so, like, that was the first admission. And then I, I don't fully understand it. I've asked a couple of people, but this ejection of the Speaker of the House feels like that is to do with the negotiations around money and mm-hmm. the use of money. And we know politicians are all self-interested in the end. Uh I wonder if they've pushed everyone so far to the point that actually they're starting to, there's some people trying to get ahead of the curve on this mm-hmm. and actually starting to speak the language of everyone who's feeling, you know, squeezed. Yeah. Um, I mean, absolutely. I think Ro Khanna is, is interesting mm. because, you know, it, the the legislation that he is um, the full sponsoring. Yeah. Get this up. Ro, he's on his Twitter. Ro, I yeah. saw this on his Twitter. Ro Khanna's Twitter. He's got these four points he wants. Right. Exactly. One of them is um, banning uh, stock trading by members of Congress. Well, he's he's one of the biggest stock traders in Congress and one of the most profitable. So he's interestingly publicly going against his own self-interest. But I, I think that is a form of admission to say that unless and until 
it's made illegal for us to do this, we're all going to do it. Um, and so do you, the American people, in fact, care? Um, and this has been the question about privacy. This has been the question about um, civil liberties. This has been the question about money. And to your point, you know, kicking off this conversation, I think most people don't care yet, but they will. In U.S. federal government, if you are a civil servant, like if you work for an agency, let's say the FAA or something, the Federal Aviation Administration, you have all sorts of restrictions on owning airline stocks or aluminum stocks or things like that, hmm. right? Which is which would make sense. But even even if you're an accountant in the FAA, even if you never have any influence over planes, there's still all these restrictions on you because you might come across information mm-hmm. that could materially affect your investment decisions. Whereas if you're in the highest seats of power, there's no restrictions, <laughs> yeah. which is backwards. The higher right. you get, uh, right. the less restrictions there are on your ability to, to day trade while you're at work. <laughs> you know? So here we go. The American people, this is Ro Khan on Twitter. The American believe, people believe Congress is broken. I mean, yes, it is, and they are correct. Here's my plan to fix it. So ban all PAC and lobbyist money from Congress. Can you explain that so we would understand what's what a PAC is and what lobbyist money is and how, like, is that, like, legalized? Bribery. Yeah, it's just um, PACs are just a legal structure um, through which interest groups lobby Congress through donations. And so in the same um, trends that you see just uh, ballooning deficits and debt, um, you also see ballooning political spending. So we, I mean, it's just a, a hockey stick. Like we spend more on elections every year by like insane amounts. Isn't it, isn't it like... Uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden spent like over a billion on advertising. Yeah. Something in- insane like that. I can't remember who, but it, yeah, the last presidential re- uh, election broke all records, as did the one before it, as did the one before it, as will the next one. Have you got it? Uh, total cost of election. What not? What, what do you mean nine billion is the total cost of election? What? 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 That could include all candidates. That could include multiple layers. Right, but it's still insane. Yeah, but you're right. From 1998 of about 1.5 billion up to nine billion. Yeah, but the the money that is financing these elections, these candidates, is right. private. Is corporate money mainly, or private donors, or rich people want influence? They're they're you know much like a stock portfolio. Your political donation portfolio is typically diversified. So, you know, you you might allocate a certain portion of that as, um, you know, anonymous to a super PAC. You might want to be on the record as donating to a PAC. You might want to be on the record as donating to a specific political candidate. Um, but those donations are capped um, at, you know, what we would consider fairly low amounts um, in relative to the aggregate. And so people find ways to channel channel their money. And one thing we've seen in New Jersey and I assume other states, but I just know that particular data point is that statistically the longer a candidate, like a house representative specifically is in office in New Jersey, the the higher the higher percentage of their of their donor money comes from out of the state. Mm-hmm. Right? So when a new candidate hmm. kind of comes in, takes a seat, um, it's often, you know, a lot of the money is going to be kind of local to get this person that they know. And that person comes in bright eyed and bushy tailed to, you know, kind of come do political work. And when they're there for term after term after term after term, um, assuming they're able to stay there that long, they start getting more and more of their funding from outside of the state. Basically, other pools of interest can start kind of picking them off and realize that this this person can help our interests. Because they have more um, federal influence? Yeah. Yeah, because they're this, even though they are the state representative, this is Congress, so mm-hmm. they have federal influence. And basically, as they get there, their main skill set becomes being able to keep the money flowing to them. They right. they get better at fundraising over time, right. and they get a, all these established networks of communication and funding. And so they get more and more funding from outside of the state. This is how the um, party leaders are chosen. They're literally chosen based on their ability to raise money. So Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell are in the positions they are in because of their financial prowess. And really, I mean, that translates into legislative prowess, unfortunately. And so where are they raised? Because if you're raising nine billion (laughs) or or, or a billion, sorry, a couple of billion, that's not going to be made up of uh, lots of people donating $3,000. No. No. So you're going to have some very significant donors in there. Absolutely. Is this essentially... 
two separate mafias fighting it out for control of the government, control of the country. Um, I, do you, know, you, you understand yes, my terminology? Well, uh, absolutely. But I would suggest that they're perhaps two different faces of the same mafia because right. most corporations actually donate pretty evenly to both parties. Um, really? They, they're, hed, they're hedging. Whoever wins, they want to make sure they're in favor. And and so do they get real influence? They do. Real policy influence. This is this is a complete breakdown in democracy. Yeah. This isn't about <laughs> this isn't about the electorate. This is yeah. about corporate interest. The right. More, the more flexible the ledger is, the more power it is to be manipulated. And when you think of the like, it's funny because nine billion sounds like a lot, but when you're talking about how a trillion dollars in federal spending or taxing <laughs> happens, lobbying. I, I've seen studies like lobbying has an amazing return on investment. Right. Because you know, you put a dollar in, you get ten dollars out, basically. Right, right. And even if you're just playing defense, even if you're just saying, we're not even trying to make more money, we're trying to make sure there's certain legislation that doesn't impair what we're already doing. Right. And if it's like if you're if you're preventing your your own company from potentially losing like a billion dollar income stream and you throw a couple million dollars to keep that from going away, totally worth it. And, and so that's why they do it. That's the whole system's been corrupted then. <laughs> because what is the point of voting for somebody when you when you know they're not making the decisions based on you, the electorate? They are making right. the decisions based on the corporate interests. Mm -hmm. And I know that's like, oh, don't be so naive, Peter. But yeah. like, you, you do have this hope that some people, some people somewhere, believe that they're going to do good for the electorate. Again, I, I have I've romanticized so hard about the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. the Constitution, what, how America was founded. Right. I have a, it's deep jealousy of your federal system. Right. Yet it feels like a, any of your forefathers would be puking. Yeah. I mean, this on what's, is what's happened here. This is not, um, I mean, this is, this is sort of one of the nightmare timelines. Um, but also, um, you know, back to your earlier question about the purpose of culture war. Yeah. So elected officials have figured out they need to serve legislatively their donor bases. So what can they throw to the individual people who, you know, give them five bucks here and there, or maybe don't donate, but vote for them? Well, the culture war wins are the easiest ones. Let's have an argument about abortion. Right. Um, or about gender yeah. um, or w sexuality or whatever. It's going to get people really riled up yeah. and make them feel like they're being represented. It makes them feel like they've got someone to vote for. Yeah. It's complete gaslighting. Yeah. So let's just look at these a couple of other things in here that Ro Khanna has suggested. Okay, the lobbyist money we've, we've covered, bank, Congress, members from trading stocks. I mean, it, it's almost ludicrous that they can. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can in the UK. The term limits is the thing that keeps coming up. Um, right. Because you have people in their 70s and 80s representing <laughs> the future right. of the youth. And at that point, they're not, they're not personally representing. What they are is a crystallization of interests yeah. that has a reliable political platform that um, just gets executed over time. And so I, d I don't know exactly what the number is, but um, to Lynn's point about you know the power of incumbents, I think the reelection rate of um, uh, incumbents it, to Congress is over 90%. So, you know, basically the hard part is getting in the first time. Once you're in, it's so much easier to get reelected and your influence grows. And that's remarkable because yeah. when, you look at, when you look at political polls of how do you approve of Congress's job, it's usually like single digit percentage. It's actually, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's, lower, terrible. it's lower than even the presidential um, approval ratings. You know, maybe low double digits sometimes when they're having a good year, but basically it's, it's <laughs> utterly terrible numbers. So the fact that, you have two simultaneous things: the incumbent um, win rate. You know, uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's ninety some ninety percent, very high, whatever the number is. And then you have approval rating, literally couldn't almost couldn't be worse. And that just that's that's evidence of a a system that's not not healthy. Yeah. And and therefore, when the last one banning Congress members from ever becoming lobbyists is this like a revolving door? So they they come oh, yeah. out of Congress and yeah. they go and become a lobbyist. Yeah. Yet they know all the people in Congress anyway. Well, they have their <laughs> phone numbers and. And, yeah. one, and one of the challenges there, so if you just did term limits, um, the risk of incentive you end up doing is that, okay, if they know they only, only can be in there for, say, eight years, um, they're like, okay, I got to make all the connections so that when I get out, I can go right into lobbying. 
mm-hmm. right? So which is part of the same organism. Yes. So right. that's why that that kind of the term limits and the and the restrictions on lobbying, either a delay period or in this case like never, those kind of go hand in hand because you're trying not to have the incentive of just okay, you're in there, that seat's for sale, and then you get the the cushy thing after. Even like for example, parts of like Medicare Part D, for example, which is like the thing that on the surface expanded, you know, drug mm. offering, but it it restricted the government's ability to like negotiate prices for those drugs. The, the Congress people that were kind of really at the heart of that end up going right into lobbying right afterwards. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, like a lot of legislation is for sale. And part of, part of this also has to do with the professionalization of public service. Yeah. So, you know, the, the generation of the, the founders of the American Republic served in Congress, but they, you know, they were human farmers or, you know, um, in the military or they practiced law, they had professions. And so, and this, this is actually still the way it is in some state legislatures. For example, like in Texas, your salary as a state legislator is only $7,500 um, a year and the legislature only meets once every two years. So the assumption is you have a source of income and you're, you're a professional, but if your entire full time job is being in Congress and then after 12 years you're voted out, I mean, that, that really disincentivizes people from doing it because at that point you have a career track record that you can't easily parlay into, mm. let's say, lobbying. And so who's going to run for Congress? Um, I guess the people who are willing to start over after 12 years or they hit their term limit, that's going to be a smaller number. I do I do wonder how much progress something like this will make, though it's like turkeys voting for Christmas. But is there any kind of movement behind this? I mean, I think I think it's quite popular. The question is is it going to translate into electoral penalties for those members of Congress who don't support that? And I think, you know, Matt Gates and Ro Khanna um, have electorates that could potentially punish them if, if they didn't uh, move on these things. But other members of Congress, their, their electoral bases may not care about this stuff. See, the, the problem is, is you only tend to get the the big shifts change when things entirely break. Yeah. It was one of the things we were talking about earlier. Um, uh, Bukele, again, whatever you think of him, he, he came at a time after decades of uh, corrupt uh, presidents who stole all the money. Uh, uh, Lebanon is co- is a completely broken country now yeah. with no governance. Uh, Javier Millet in uh, Argentina is coming through at a time where, again, the country is close to breaking. Perhaps, you know, the, the progress maybe RFK has made and Vivek is in response to things like this. But I guess you you would know this as somebody who's studied this more. You don't, you, you'd only tend to get the revolutionary changes at the time of absolute collapse. Yeah, it's, you know, there's... So historians have demonstrated how when um, an empire or civilization is in decline, there's an increasing rate of like stochastic tragedies, you know, (laughs) whether it's, you know, conflicts, crime, um, you know, uh, shortages, like basically the, the level of ambient chaos in the society rises slowly. And just to jump in there, we are seeing people openly raid Gucci stores, Apple stores, right. Walmarts and steal anything we want. We're seeing an increase of murders in places like New York. We're seeing a massive increase in crime. So we're seeing all those things you've just said. Right. And, you know, mass shootings. I mean, like, they're just, they're more and more every year. Um, they're very hard to predict. Um, and so, you know, that trend generally continues until there's some breaking point. And generally that is either you know, war or some kind of plague, pestilence or economic collapse. And then there's an opportunity to refound. But, you know, one of the reasons I'm calling for it now is like, maybe we don't have to wait for that. Maybe we can be proactive. And the risk when doing it, when things get dire, is it increases the odds of the purse, what you shift towards and being even worse than what was before. Mm -hmm. So basically when things totally break, that's the moment where transformation comes. And you could have a thing where you kind of have this big rebirth and, you know, basically you elect people that finally things change and go in the right direction. The opposite path, like what we saw after Weimar, 
yeah. is that, you know, people just want, they want security, they want someone to blame, they want, you know, and so you get, you get a monster in charge that feeds on that energy and promises, we're going to give you security. It's not your fault. It's their fault. It's, you know, and you, you blame some group that wasn't involved and then you have some sort of horrible outcome. And yeah. so that's how you can get things like fascism or communism. Um, when you have a breakdown of what was previously a somewhat healthy system that became increasingly healthy. And then when it breaks, instead of kind of rebuilding it, this more virtuous thing, you go in these one of extreme directions. That was when you mentioned earlier, horrific outcomes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can only think of horrific outcomes. Are, are there examples where there has been a significant turnaround in a rapidly declining uh, mm. economy or country? That's a good question. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> because if you don't have one, it means we're fucked. <laughs> I mean, generally when we see in the United States, for example, one of the reasons it's as powerful as it is now is when it ever had these big, big pivotal turning points, um, instead of completely collapsing and going in like an extreme direction, usually it kind of partially collapses and then goes in a very concentrated direction, but one that um, historians tend to look back with mixed results, right? So for example, during the Civil War era, you know, borderline yeah, collapse too, yeah. and the the push was towards Lincoln that was that yeah. that was the outcome and during the Great Depression the push was towards FDR and he's I mean there's a lot of criticisms of FDR um, but at the same time it's it's not as extreme as what in many cases we saw in the rest of the world at the time right. if you were kind of just doing a at, at that time comparison America picked one of the less extreme routes out there compared to what you saw in in other parts of the world in the early in the early 20th century so there are like historical examples of this there's also i cite in i cite uh in the book um uh greece ancient greece when they elected you know salon um basically they were facing generational collapse and they kind of put in this like you know kind of hardcore moderate to try to right the ship and ended up being somewhat successful so mm -hmm. there are there are kind of times that the needle gets threaded but then of course What's great about it is that even when those are threaded, there's some people that really don't like the outcome, but they're there to, to criticize the outcome, right? That means yeah. the outcome is not as bad as it could have been. Right. You know? <laughs> so would you say Bukele is a hardcore moderate? I think he's showing some signs of that path where basically it got so bad yeah. that they went in a new direction. Um, and there's a lot of clearly good things that are happening there in terms of you know reduced crime rates, um, some of the best performing emerging market finances in, in this current time. Um, he seems very well intentioned on trying to make a, a better country. Mm -hmm. um, the way the way that I try to assess the situation, and I'm not really a political expert, but just when I kind you of seem pretty good to me. <laughs> when I, when I try to address this, basically what I do is I don't try to like put my situation on an extreme environment. And say, well, you shouldn't have done that because you know you you violate rights of. It's like it's it's basically a war that happened, mm -hmm. and in war mm -hmm. things get yeah. terrible. The way that I would start kind of assessing it or judging it is okay. Now that you've got power, now that you've got popularity, and you're building the future, are you steadily decentralizing that power? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's it's like sticking the landing, right? right. It's like exactly. you, you've done the first part. Yeah, you've stabilized the country. You've you are a popular leader there. That, that's what, you know, he's, most polls show that he's, he's mm -hmm. genuinely popular. The question is, when we look back in 20 years, are you going to be like on your like fourth term and there's absolutely no decentralization of power, it's all you? That, that's the path that, that's the, that's the wider path that most things go through. The question is, when you have all of this social capital, uh, concentration of power, things generally going in a better direction, do you then start, okay, saying, well, when things are going well, we're going to think about who's in here after me, mm -hmm. right? Or what happens with me in the future? And you start saying, we're going to make sure that there's a renewed independent judiciary, yeah. a renewed independence. If you build those distributed powers after having this kind of decisive trend change, that's what I would consider successful. And I guess the risk there, Natalie, is that uh, he does such a good job at uh, turning around El Salvador's uh, fortunes, you know, uh, has reduced crime, has uh, uh, increased tourism, has improved the economy. That, and we know he's going to run for a second term, which is, even though he claims is fine, it's kind of unconstitutional. The mm -hmm. constitution says single terms. He has the belief that, well, if I 
make El Salvador democratic again and I don't run, somebody else might come in and ruin everything I've done. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, you know, God complex risk of believing that he has to stay in power to maintain what he's built. Yeah. And that's where you can go to back to decline. Right. Yeah. So what Lynn said is absolutely spot on. Um, The uh, scholarship on democratization around the world um, often, I mean, always state formation, nation formation, these are sovereign acts. So again, going back to what is behind the law, what precedes the law? Well, generally it's violence. It's some form of unilateral dictatorial sovereign violence. The, the difference between a country spiraling into chaos and prospering is, you know, first of all, in the character of the leadership exercising that violence. So leadership absolutely matters, 100%. But then that leadership's ability to institutionalize the um, workings of the machine of governance such that they personally are no longer needed. So the sovereign steps back behind the curtain. Um, And people who have grown up in relative peace and prosperity with relatively well-functioning institutions often forget that there's that violence behind the curtain. And so they say things like, why do we even need commodity money? Like we have, we have a perfectly good state credit money system. Um, But when the curtain gets torn asunder, what emerges? Well, listen, I'm conscious we've, uh, we've got a red line that's going to come come very soon and I'm going to talk about this for hours with you. There is one yeah. thing that was just completely on my mind earlier and I didn't get to ask this. Uh, I'll point it to you, Lynn. Um, we, it's a complete side point, but it's just a, a question I had. We have uh, failing currencies around the world um, and uh, countries with massive inflation, double, triple digit inflation, but we have these people with the ability to escape from their sovereign currencies with the dollar. So we've seen this. What happens there when the dollar fails? I think that's the big question. Basically, <laughs> right now, the dollar is the predator for any weaker currency, yeah. which is every developing currency. And stable coins give them more kind of insertion points into some of these countries than they had before the invention of the stable coin. But I think that's the big question. Basically, when these major currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, when they get such high debt to GDP, when they have all this interest expense, when they run into, say, a, an energy shortage, you know, a, a mm-hmm. more sustained one, basically a, a, tr- a true kind of commodity capex cycle, um, that's when you get these kind of big turning points. And I think if in a world where Bitcoin was never invented, I think the most likely approach would be they they would recapitalize with gold. Essentially, mm-hmm. there's even there's even like kind of um on the in the Fed handbook and the Treasury kind of Fed interactions, there's legal details on how they can essentially recapitalize with gold. Um, and other countries kind of have that too to varying degrees. And so that'd be like the the method in the alternative world. Obviously, we're in this world where we have Bitcoin. And so, and I think Jeff Booth described it in your podcast, it's like comes on a couple of questions. Does Bitcoin remain decentralized and secure? Yes. In that flow chart. If the answer is no, then go back to what I just said about maybe recapitalizing with gold. If the answer is yes, then that is basically a predator towards any currency that is you know, more controlled, more inflationary. And it stands there kind of still growing and getting stronger. And we're at, you know, Pacific Bitcoin Festival Mm -hmm. in a bear market. People here couldn't be more excited. Um, And, you know, they're all building this future. They're building what they see is, 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 you know, worth building. And so I think that Bitcoin's there, hopefully. We have an optimistic end. (laughs) Yes. Right. Um, Thank you. If you are listening and you haven't bought Lynn's book, Broken Money, what are you? I'm, I'm assuming everyone who listens to this has bought it by now, uh, but if you haven't, uh, anywhere you want to send people, anything you want to share, Natalie? Well, um, stay tuned because the Texas Bitcoin Foundation is launching our first book, The Satoshi Papers, next year. That's what I was hinting um, at. I didn't know if I could say it. Yes, absolutely. I can't give you an exact date yet, but um, we are well at work um, to meet our deadline. And we always appreciate support. You know, we're a shoestring operation. Donations are fully tax deductible. So if you want to, you know, send some sats our way, we we would really appreciate it. Amazing. Uh, you two are unbelievable. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, I think we have to get back there, don't we? <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes.